County. Right <laughs> Thank you for being here. You recently wrote a book on the Yuba County Five. It's called Things Aren't Right. Um, but tell us who you are and uh, and and a little bit about your work on this case, please. Sure. I'm Tony Wright. I'm the author of Things Aren't Right, The Disappearance of the Yuba County Five. I'm an archivist by trade, and I'm a fan of true crime, unsolved mysteries, and the unexplained. It was 2018 when I first heard about this case and wanted to read a book on the Yuba County Five. Nothing was available. So I did some thinking and talked to a few people and decided to write my first true crime book. I have a job where I do quite a bit of research going through newspaper archives and uh, other state and local archives to get research information. And I've worked with police records before in my job. So I thought this would be a great use of my skills. And I reached out to the families, the media that covered the case and law enforcement that was involved in the case as well back in 1978. And it took about four years to work on the book. COVID kind of got in there and really slowed everything down. But the final result is this book. And it's been referred to as the Bible for the Yuba County Five case, which I'm happy to hear from my fellow Yuba County Five researchers. And so the case still has quite a bit of interest. And I'm glad to deliver this book to people that are interested in the case that either know quite a bit about the case or just brand new to the story. Yeah. And I actually, I would agree with the assessment in, in terms of, there weren't many books out there. I know Drew Beeson wrote a book, um, but yours, I could describe it as a Bible because I don't think I saw <laughs> anything in there that, you know, I would have had to add or anything. It seemed you covered all your, it seems like you probably talked to every last living person that had anything to do with this case um that you could find and i know that's not easy because i tried to find them too because <laughs> tracking people down is not easy sometimes um yeah so the information in there uh great uh yeah i wouldn't have added anything i learned a, a, a lot of new things especially stuff uh, you had a lot of focus on who these who these men were by interviewing the family so there was a lot of great info in there um I'm going to put a little preamble to this interview where I ask people to, you know, if you don't, if you're not familiar with the Yuba County Five, that you should maybe watch my video or buy your book, whatever, get a little familiar right. because we can't go over all the details in this interview. Um, we're going to hit some broad strokes just to refresh people's memories. Um, but do you think you could briefly go over who the five men were without, you know, going into super detail about, you know, their backgrounds? If you want to get that, read his book because there's tons of information on each of the men, but who were these five guys? So there was Ted Weir. He was the oldest of the group. He was 32 years old. He lived in the Marysville, Yuba city area, just like the others. He worked for the gateway projects, which was an organization that provided jobs to people with disabilities and also to those who were struggling with mental illness. And he was friends with Jack Madruga, who was roughly 30 years old at the time of the disappearance. He was the driver of the group, if you will, because he owned a 1969 Mercury Montego. And he was known as sort of a quiet um, guy who enjoyed life and just loved doing things with his friends and family. And he was friends with Bill Sterling, who was about 29 years old at the time of his disappearance. Uh, Bill was deeply religious, a uh, quiet guy, but loved the bowl. Uh, there was Jackie Hewitt, who was uh, probably about 23 years old at the time that he disappeared. Uh, Jackie was very good friends with Ted Weir. They had a close bond, sort of big brother, little brother. Jackie loved his motorcycle. He loved hanging out with his friends, loved basketball loved to just go bowling or go to the roller skating rink with people like Ted Weir and just have a good time. And there was Gary Mathias, who was about 24, 25 years old at the time of his disappearance. Gary was the one person in the group that had a mental illness. He had, he had been diagnosed with schizophrenia. He had been on a regimen of medication since 1975. He was turning his life around after struggling with schizophrenia for probably maybe four or five years. 
and Gary loved music. Gary loved basketball. He loved sports. Uh, they were all family people. They all had their passions, which included playing for the Gateway Gators, which was the basketball team for the Gateway Projects. So they were active. They all held jobs of some kind. They did things with their families. They were social. They loved to go out of town together, or go out of town with their families and either watch basketball games or just do whatever. And so uh, these men, they, they were very productive. They had dreams and they had great friendships and the families collectively referred to the group as the boys due to their intellectual disabilities. Um, they kind of saw them a little bit as childlike in ways with some of their behaviors and mannerisms, but uh, the five were good friends and they had big plans uh, in life and their plans involved on February 24th, 1978 to go to a basketball game in Chico, California. And the next day on February 25th, the plan was to go down towards Sacramento to be in a Special Olympics basketball tournament because if they won that tournament, a few months, or actually not a few months, uh, maybe about five months later, uh, they would be invited down to UCLA to be involved in the state Special Olympics tournament, which involved a trip to Disneyland. So these guys were very, very dedicated. Um, to getting to that game and playing there. But first thing was first, they had to go see their favorite team, UC Davis, play an away game at Chico State on the 24th. And it was that trip to Chico on the 24th that just, it's the mystery, that's where it begins. And whatever happened, we're not too sure, but they disappeared that night on February 24th, coming home. Right, and that was a good, uh, a good setup because right off the bat, we know that they had plans, big plans they were excited for. So this, yes. that's not something you usually see in people who are intending to disappear. So some people say maybe they intended to do this or that, but that would kind of go against that. Um, so let's talk about February 24th. We know they, they travel north from Yuba City. They go to Chico. That's something like 46 miles. Um, right. I believe... They traveled on Highway 99. I through your book, I, I you know realized there may have been some discrepancy between how many times they've done that or not, or how many times they've made that trip or not. Um, we don't really know what they did in the end. We can only guess, um, but we do know they attended the game. They were there. People saw them there. Um, the game ends around 10 p.m. They go to a market. They pick up some snacks. They're seen again there, and after that they kind of drop off the map a little bit in terms of what we would have thought they would do. We would think they would just head straight home. Right. And right. so who's the next person to see them or where do they next pop up that night? Well, we, they're at the game. They go to the convenience store after the game, which is called bears market in Chico. They buy drinks. They buy basically junk food. And the person working behind the counter, her name's Mary Davis. She was not too thrilled to see these guys walking in at closing time because you're closing, it's Friday night, you want to get home, you're kind of just done with the day. But they come in, they quickly gather what they need, they go up to the register, they pay, they walk out the door. From there, they get back on the highway home, but instead of driving home, they take a huge detour into the Plumas National Forest where they abandon their car on a snow-covered road in the middle of nowhere. And the last person to see them is a man by the name of Joseph Shones, who is also on the same road, middle of nowhere. His car is broken down. He's suffered a heart attack a few hours earlier. And he sees their car pull up. And depending on what story you're hearing from Shones, they either get out of the car or... There's another car behind their car, a supposed red pickup truck. They either get in the pickup truck or they run into the woods. It's this is really the hard part for those of us who've been researching the case. What right. part of Shones' story happened? They either right. got out of the car and ran away, they got into another car and drove off. But 
the car they were driving in, that 1969 Mercury Montego, owned and driven by Jack Madruga, is abandoned in the Plumas National Forest. And if you look at that on a map, it's 75 miles in the wrong direction from home. And if you've ever been up to the Plumas National Forest, it's in the foothills of the Sierra Nevada mountains. It's incredibly rocky terrain. And the temperature up there would have been much colder than it was down towards places like Oroville, Yuba City, Marysville, because it was below freezing. They had a lot of snow up there. So these guys were way off track to get home. Right. And yeah. so that's the last time anyone sees them alive is okay. February, February 24th, 1978. It could be around 11 p.m. or it could be sometime after when it hits midnight, February 25th. Right. We're thinking the last time they're seen is probably sometime between 11 p.m. and midnight, um, starting on that night of uh, Friday, February 24th, 1978. Okay. And so, and Joseph Schoen's, uh, like you said, uh, his story has so much variation in it. It's really hard to pin anything down. But from what we know about that night, he started out in Berry Creek, which is um, a little bit north of Oroville, up in the mountains, kind of. And yes. he's basically starts the night out by drinking. Um, mm -hmm. By all accounts, he's kind of an alcoholic, in fact. Uh, yes. He hits, a, he hits a bar. He has a few beers. He goes to the Mountain House Bar. He has some more. And then he says something about wanting to go up and check on the snow. And then he right. goes up there and he gets stuck, right? And then he yes. has a heart attack while trying to get his vehicle out. And um, so one thing I learned from your book I hadn't heard before was that Shones may have had a condition called angina, which is a heart condition that can cause a lot of the symptoms he described. Mm -hmm. Um what do you think about this heart attack scenario? Do you think he had a heart? Because we don't really know because HIPAA laws right. and whatnot. Do you think he right. just he knew he was having an attack from this condition he had and maybe, you know, that occurred? Do you think he really had a heart attack? Do you think it happened at all? Uh, because he had, makes a lot of he, he basically is able to change his story based on this heart attack by saying, well, I was hallucinating or I, I wasn't in my right mind. What do you think about all that? I honestly don't know what to think sometimes. I, I want to give him the benefit of the doubt sometimes. Other times, I think he he wanted to get a story to the best of his abilities to get some of the reward money because once the men went missing, some reward money was posted, which I believe if you adjust it for inflation, it could be like 10 grand, 12 grand today. So if you kind of need money and you give just enough information, be like hey i got a story about those guys he, here's the thing and i have to put all this together as best i can so the time he leaves mountain house as you said where he's drinking beer um is probably 5 30 p.m on february 24th maybe six o'clock at the latest so if he goes north of mountain house up into the plumas he basically parks his car on a road that leads to nowhere. It's in the middle of nowhere. It's rutted. It's snow covered. And he gets his car stuck. But he wants to see the snow line. My problem with his story of wanting to see the snow line is he could have just gone into Mountain House and could have asked someone, you know, hey, do you guys know the condition of the road? Do you, do you know what's going on? What it looks like? Because I've talked to people that knew Shones and what they've always been under the impression of is he was never truthful to them. And there's people have questioned his character for a long time. And OK, if he goes up there, it's 5, 5 30 p.m., 6 p.m., he has a heart attack. If the guys don't show up until 11 p.m. That's like five hours he's been up there. If if you feel you're having a heart attack and you're on the brink of death, um, I think you're going to do everything in your power to basically get somewhere, get the help or do whatever you can. But if he sees him at 11 o'clock between or there and midnight, they disappear he gets back in the car, spends more time in his car, 
and then eventually walks back to Mountain House. He's been up and he gets to Mountain House February 25th, what, 9 a.m.? 10 a.m. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he's been yeah. having a heart attack. Um, it, it's just hard to put that together. Like you're experiencing all that. You're doing all that. You know, you're going through a heart attack because I, I've talked to people who've gone through heart attacks and they've talked about all the pain, all the how tough it is just to do stuff. And with Sean's being exposed to the elements, walking from his car to Mountain House and below freezing temperatures, like, how do you not have like anything like hypothermia? How is this condition not worsened? And when he gets to the mountain house the next day after walking from his car, roughly eight miles, and it took him forever to get there, five to eight miles maybe, he never tells anyone like, hey, I got a heart attack. Can someone call some squad or something and just get me to the hospital? He doesn't do that. He's like, can someone drive me home? And he asked for aspirin. And he makes that comment too that i should have done this two years ago and odd yeah to should, say, by all accounts should have done what like you should have listened to your doctor two years ago yeah. she should exactly have... it could be anything uh, but you know yeah a mystery I, I should have gotten rid of that vw bug i was driving two years ago like right. I, I i don't under, i don't understand it and the thing about shones is he's the last person to see these guys alive and reading all of his if you read all the information he gives to the papers the information that he gives to law enforcement, it all contradicts itself. Yeah. And you can connect the dots by looking at all the interviews that he gives. Uh, probably it'd be like late February, early March, 1978. And his stories vary. Um, he can say, well, I had a heart, heart attack. I don't remember. He talked to law enforcement twice. They took notes from the interview with Shones. And, you know, getting back to the fact that did he have a heart attack? It, it's hard to tell with Shones because right. it, it, we weren't there. And uh, judging by what he did, it doesn't look like it was as serious of a situation as it was. Yeah, I would agree with that. And one, one thing um, I took away from your book as well, you know, is that when you think about it, I've always, you know, well, here's this guy. And he happens to be up in the snow on this night in this exact right. spot. It, yeah. it seems like what is what are the chances that that could just happen? But in your exactly. book, it's one of those things that I, I also question that because there's stories of Shones getting stuck in the snow and people helping him out. Like this is almost a regular thing that he did in that area. And that mm -hmm. makes me quite well, wait, if he's doing this all the time, uh, you know. So this is like a trend with him. He just drives his car into the snow places and people have to help him get out. And and why is he doing that? What I mean, because you've heard those stories, right? That came out of your, yes. you. Know, people told you that. And, right. And was this just him being drunk and driving his car into the snow? Do you know? And, and that people would help have to help him in those scenarios? From talking to, I know, talking to one individual that knew him, their answer was... Yes, that they helped him multiple times. They knew that he was constantly drinking. According to their memory, uh, he had a drinking problem. And if you look, uh, you know, I looked at the police records and it gave a full history on Shones. He has a history of drinking and driving. Yeah. And it goes back to the 1950s. So, sorry, nothing's changed since the 50s. This guy has a pattern of being drunk in public, which is in his record, drinking and driving, which is in his record, and from people up there, Mountain House, and also in that area, Berry Creek, Shones was known for being the local drunk, and they said that they would, that his car would get stuck in the snow, and the lady that waited on him at Mountain House said that she was surprised he drove north from Mountain House because she knew he'd get stuck on the road. And looking at the snow line, like I said, there, there's nothing to look at. Um, there was no frolicking in the snow he was going to do because right. I had heard, you know, from a few people that he was not the outdoorsman, neither was his family. And so there could have been a reason for him to go up that way. Maybe he didn't want to explain why he went the way he did. 
because even talking to a lot of people who've lived up in the Plumas and sort of hearing some of their stories, there's just a lot of banana stuff that just goes. I mean, it's just absolutely bananas up there from illegal drug growing to meth yeah. labs to just just general tomfoolery, drunken fights, craziness. I mean, it, and that's it's kind sort of, of the wild west. Yeah. I think that's important to the story too, because it tells you like what kind of person Shones might be, you know, in terms of, I mean, we can get into theories later, but it just goes to a theory I kind of have um, about it all. But one actually related to Shones being stuck in that area I want to get to is that I get a lot of, I've gotten a lot of emails and comments about this inconsistency. To me, it, it's a little minute, but a lot of people bring it up to me. And that's that Shones talks about getting in his car and warming himself up in this VW bug. And I can't tell you how many people I've had contact me and say, that doesn't work like that, that you can't yeah. have the heat. I have my own theory or opinion on that, but what is your take on this thing? Uh, you've, heard, you've heard of that, I'm assuming. I've heard, I've heard both sides of the story, but one person that I saw that they had posted on their blog, they said, you know, their VW bug did all right in the winter and the heat worked. Yeah. But I've talked to other people who complained about you know had many grievances against volkswagen in general <laughs> but they were but they were but they were uh bug owners and they said yeah with the air-cooled engine you, you'd probably get some air going but it's not quite you know the best and it's not yeah. going to do a lot um but if shones is in the car and it's not doing a great job of heating up the car um how much gas did he have in the tank that day? Uh, if you're going to let your, cause I live in the Midwest. Sometimes you're going to let your car run uh, when it's cold. It gets below freezing here. Those days are just terrible. I, I get it. But to just like sit in a car that's been idling in the snow, it, you've, you've got a lot going on here, especially with that VW. And if it's not, generating heat what's the point of running the car so if he turns off the car now he's exposed to the elements if he's exposed to the elements hypothermia is going to kick in at some point um especially if he starts walking the mountain house because if there's snow on the road and snow on the ground and he's not wearing the proper clothing uh he falls down gets wet from the snow and the mud and the rain and whatever i mean that's it that's miserable it you're yeah. absolutely just playing a dangerous game if you somehow get your clothes wet your shoes wet and you're walking in the freezing temperatures and it, it's hard to tell what shones was doing in that car because his stories vary from he's laying down in the car he's got a window open with his legs hanging out he, i mean it varies yeah and that's so, an interesting point i didn't remember that being part of my research that when he he was in the car with his legs hanging out for a while which would really negate the heat factor of being in the car but i think he gets in at some point right and he and has closes to the door he has to he really does yeah and, and you know i guess my take on the whole thing uh, this this theory uh, of you know that it doesn't make sense that he would get you know i i had a car that was an early 70s car back in the day and its heater didn't work um but even with the engine on, I remember the engine generated a good good amount of heat, even in winter, that you know I could be fairly comfortable just sitting in the car with the engine running. Now, I wasn't a VW, so I can't make a one-to-one -one comparison. Um, but I would got to think if he had the engine running, it would be at least slightly warmer than if you were standing outside in the wind. You know, At least you're protected from the wind. Maybe you're getting a little heat coming off. So I don't think it's like completely out of this world that he could have stayed alive in there maybe right you know? um that's just for the people that always send me that theory that's for you um yeah I, you know i don't think it's a smoking gun or anything uh no. uh but okay so we know shones gets a ride home and he, he passes out you know he's he's had a long night um yeah and and what happens then like his wife and daughter come home they see him in bed and like, hey, what's up? According to the police report, or the uh, sh sheriff's report, Shones tells his wife that the car's up in the plumas and, you know, he had quite the night. So instead of taking him 
directly to the hospital, his wife goes and tries to get the car. So if this guy's having a heart attack, what are you going to do? You're going to take him to the hospital or you're going to go get your car. And that's what she did. She went to get the car with her daughter and another person. <clears throat> and, you know, I'm sorry or, to interrupt you, but it, it's one of those things you, when you say it, like, it makes me think like the angina, like maybe this is something he'd experienced before and was all, yeah. they were used to it almost. Like, yeah. Oh, this just happens occasionally. He has this and it's like, because they didn't seem like, total like it was an emergency do you have that same yeah. kind of feeling about it yeah, that's exactly the the way i feel because it's like okay you know even the talk of him walking as far as he did to mountain house and the amount of time and you just walk in and you're just like Ugh, i just need some aspirin yeah. either i mean if you're having a heart attack and you feel like you're a goner the, the first thing you want to do is like right get help and they, I don't know how insurance was at the time for people and what, you know, what an ambulance ride would cost you out of pocket. I, I have no idea. Right. Uh, and maybe he wasn't one for doctors. I don't know. But, but the thing about this guy is it, you know, if he's having this big of a heart attack as he is, why do you go get the car? Someone else, you could have asked someone else, you know, to get it for you, or you could have gone back to get it. Um, it certainly and, establishes priorities, like what their priorities were, which yeah, is interesting, you know. Yeah, and it, it's a little bit strange because they go to get the car, but, you know, they don't bring really anything with them equipment-wise to get the car because they yeah. realize that Joe killed, basically drained the battery and he used up all the gas in the car. So what they have to do is go home and then come back. So they do this on Saturday. They come back again on Sunday, get the car freed. And then that's that. Right. And um, they see the Montego there at yes. the time, but don't really think anything of it. Right. Right. And other people are up there as well at the time. Uh, they see the car, think nothing of it. Uh, there was other people up there just hanging out doing whatever and they said yeah we saw that car um and there was a guy up there i think he was like cross-country skiing or something and he said yeah i saw shones's car and i saw uh the montego and you know it, it must be typical for them just to see these cars up there um and with the car up there it's not reported missing or not reported to the yuba county sheriff's office until tuesday the 28th so that car had been up there for a period of time and Shones's car is long gone. Yeah. Now, by the time they find uh, Jack Madruga's Montego. So it's like, okay, there's a big gap in time here where that car goes missing. Nobody mentions anything about this Montego being up in the Plumas. Uh, nobody reports anything and, or, you know, says anything to anyone else, especially Shones when he gets into mountain house, he never says anything about the Montego they interviewed like four people who were there with him that morning. They said he said nothing about the Montego and all he's talked about was himself. Yeah. And so it wasn't until like, I think it was a forest service ranger. He, I mean, I guess they, they put out some sort of APB on the Montego eventually. And then a forest service ranger sees it up there and then reports it. It happens kind of like that. And that's how they I, finally find it. What happened was, the guy who worked for the forestry service did see the car and he was watching the news and then two and two. Okay. And the said, he's like, Oh, that's that car. So he calls, I believe it's the Butte County Sheriff's department because it's Butte County where the car is abandoned. Four of the five guys live in Yuba County. So on Saturday, the 25th at 8 PM, the parents were actually able to put out a missing persons bulletin. They wanted to do it first thing Saturday morning, but the law enforcement or sheriff's department was like, no, 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 they're, they're adults, can't do that. So by the 28th, they get word that, hey, we found the car that these guys were driving. It's up in the Plumas National Forest, 75 miles away from Marysville, Yuba City. So, law enforcement and the families kind of get up that way to figure out like, okay, why are they up here? How'd they get up right. here? Um, 
Yeah, yeah, it was that forestry service worker that yeah. had they not said anything, who knows when they would have found that car. <laughs> exactly, because it's in such an odd place that, and because people go up there and they do stuff in the snow. And so I guess all the people that saw it previously, they don't really think anything of it. They think maybe this yeah. person's out there cross country skiing or, or something or other. And, uh, but we finally, they do finally find it. And there's not much odd about it. Well, what's odd about it is that there's not much odd about it because there's still gas in the car. It's mm -hmm. stuck, but not terribly stuck in the snow. No. Um, we, there's a window on the driver's side rolled partially down, which was unusual because Jack Madruga, they said he wouldn't leave his car like that in such a, in such a state, which so I, I believe, is that correct? As far as yes. Everything? Okay. And so the vehicle is just in this odd state where it doesn't make sense why they would have left it there and where they've gone. And this kind of kicks off the search up in Plumas where now they know they must be here somewhere and they're look and it's a you know, if you even look on it in like a topographic map that place is rough it's all steep you've been up oh, there yeah. Uh, yeah i've been up there a couple times and it's uh during even, the day and during the night and it's rough it's even rough today terrain. are the roads i mean i gotta imagine the roads are a little better but it, it did you go walking around in the forest and stuff around i that didn't area? go I didn't go walking, walking around the forest. I did mostly driving from Marysville, Yuba City up to the first time I got to get up to the road near Rogers Cow Camp where they abandoned the car. Mm -hmm. So that was that was a heck of a drive. But I went up there with the Yuba County Sheriff's Department and they were kind of showing me around. I did walk around some and just getting a feel for the land. I mean, it's not. It, you're just not walking into walled you're not thrilled like i'll just walk right into right. the woods yeah no it's 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 pretty rough up there and there's a few times i was kind of getting the lay of the land and i'm thinking man this is some rough walking if you got to do it but at the time uh so the roads are paved now but at the time there was a certain point where the roads weren't paved right. so you're kind of driving on these gravelly roads and, and like, that's where they were cup. stuck right they they've been they had been off paved road for a couple hundred yards, I believe. Is that yes. correct? Yes. Yeah. So for Madruga to drive on a road that they referred to as rutted, they didn't buy the fact that he would drive up that road because he once refused to drop off Jackie Hewitt at his house because he didn't like the road near Jackie's house because it had it was maybe there were some potholes and he didn't want to hit a pothole and hurt his car, or damage his undercarriage or anything like that. So, but the car, when they drove up the road, was driven carefully, right? slowly up that road, and it leads to nowhere. It doesn't connect to a high, I mean, once you, you hit a certain point up in the Plumas, you're in the middle of nowhere, especially at night. I was driving up there at night, and I'm thinking, like, no way in hell would I do this uh, again, just driving up here. Did it, did it kind of make, it? was it kind of a little scary almost, just being Yeah, it's for... It's kind of freaky because it's like these winding roads, middle nowhere, pitch black in spots. Which is really uh, interesting because some of the kids, the U of five, they were afraid of the dark. They didn't like yeah. the snow. This is yeah, not I their mean, environment they like. Yeah, they weren't. I mean, they do stuff outdoors like go swimming or hunting, fishing with their families. But overall, it wasn't their big thing to go up into the plumas you know, just yeah. to hang out in the snow and, and they weren't, you know, overall, they, they weren't big in the snow. There was a few of them that were just not a fan of the dark. Um, so to be in that situation with all these negatives, I don't like being outdoors. I don't like being cold. I don't like the snow. I don't like the dark. I don't like being away from home. Then why are they there? And it's right. not, making any sense whatsoever that they would take that crazy detour because if you drive that road it winds up into the foothills of the mountains and there's places to turn around because if they got lost jack madruga could have been like no nah, we're, we're going the wrong way because there's something you cross at lake orville called the bidwell bar bridge which is this curving bridge that spans over the over lake orville so if madruga hits that and drives over it he would probably he should have known like no nah, this is like Oreville. Right. i, I it, shouldn't it be would have here. been a, a a 
total red flag that this is we don't go this way yeah and i drove it at night and it wasn't lit up but still i it's you know you're on the bridge and these guys and especially jack machuga and his driving experience should have known that i'm not driving over a bridge to get back to marysville or yuba city because there's two highways that run parallel to each other 70 which would take you in the marysville and 99 which takes you in the yuba city if, if he was on one of those roads he would know they're not winding roads with snow and you don't cross a big bridge and there's a right. sort of another sort of like a uh, bridge that sort of spans over a valley that they crossed over and Madruga would have known. And, you know, especially when you start seeing pine trees and rocky roads and stuff like that, you're, you're going up. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. That's a clear indicator. We're, we're, we're not heading, we're not in Kansas anymore. Right. And so there's a, you know, I guess everyone's confused as to why the car would be there. The sheriff, the parents, everyone, no one knows what's going on. But they start the search there. Um, I want to get into some other things. So I don't want to spend too much time on like the search and stuff, because I guess they didn't find a lot. They got a lot of like reports of sightings. And all I guess I'll ask you really quick. Did you find any of those to be particularly relevant? Uh, the multiple different sightings of the boys at different areas. Um, did you find them to be compelling in any way other than, you know, OK, none. Uh, I, I... So they start receiving information on the men being missing, probably, I would say maybe starting around Sunday, the 25th, Monday, the, oh no, maybe Sunday on the 26th, Monday, the 27th, they might start a few things trickle in where people claim they saw them near Sacramento, uh, which was the bulk of some of these sightings was the Sacramento area. And Sacramento is about 40, 45 minutes south of Yuba City, something like that. Um, people just said, oh, I saw someone who looked like they had a disability and, and sort of fit that, uh, you know, whatever they had in their mind is what someone with a disability looks like. Right. Um, they said, oh, that's got to be them. Because yeah. there was one sighting was at a roller rink and that caught the attention of the authorities because they love to go roller skating. And they went down there and found out like, no, it wasn't them. It wasn't their car. Um, they're seen like at a, a couple of them were seen in a movie theater or at a bar. Uh, someone claimed that they saw maybe one or two of them hanging around a hotel somewhere, um, which, which is completely out of character. The worst one was the lady who claimed to see all five of them at a convenience store, which would have been, I think, 50, 60 miles south of where the car yeah. was abandoned. But they're wearing different clothes. It's the like Jackie Hewitt was on the phone talking to someone, right. but he wasn't someone who was big on talking on the phone, didn't care for it. And they're all wearing different clothes and it... people bring that one up to me because of the red truck. They say, well, there was a red truck there and, and Sean said he saw a red truck. So they, it's gotta be real and it's gotta be connected, but I don't think so. No, that that's and this red truck, man, if, if it's connected <laughs> to the story, I, I would love to know, but it, it's something that just keeps coming up that there's this pickup truck that, apparently followed the men up into the plumas and it's tied to their disappearance but the person who made the claim of seeing the men at another convenience store they're wearing different clothes and when they were when the remains of four of the five were found the clothes that were found matched the clothes they were wearing the night they disappeared right so you went and put on the clothes take off the clothes and if you could go home, why wouldn't you just go home? You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, if they had made it 60 miles south and they're in a truck, why not go home? And th that story, in my opinion, is very frustrating because I don't believe anything that came out of the lady's mouth that made yeah. that claim. I think she wanted the reward money and it was just one of those convenient stories where... 
you know, either she was going to split it with somebody like either the owner of the store who could have corroborated her story. Right. Again, it's like, you know, 10 to $12,000. And if you're hard up for cash, you know, why not make up a story? And there's a lot of sightings of the men that people claim. Uh, the furthest one that I saw from uh, the car was Los Angeles, where there's a student at USC. She's riding the bus and claimed that some of the guys got on the bus and was riding around downtown LA with her. And they kind of looked into it and wasn't true. Right. And I um, guess a, a point I would make is that you know, if, if anyone, you know, just from watching this channel long enough, you'll realize that it's not uncommon to get these sightings in almost any missing persons case, especially one that's really high profile. Um, right. Sightings just start pouring in randomly of people that are sure they saw this individual. And then oftentimes it turns out there's just no possible way they could have. People are mistaken. They have ulterior motives. You never really know what's going on, but uh, yeah, just because someone says they saw somebody, it doesn't really mean they did. It's uh, true. And, and it's it's super frustrating because they have to follow these leads and follow up on yeah. every phone call. And they, they had some absolutely outrageous people getting in touch with them, like their theories on what happened to the guys. And it's like, oh, <laughs> man, like I, I'm I felt sorry for law enforcement having to deal with all these dead ends. But, oh, you yeah, know, they would have to look at they'd have to follow some of these leads and figure out what to do. Right. Um, so let's fast forward a bit. Cause I want to make sure we have plenty of time to uh, spend on the recovery and, and theories and stuff. Um, so let's fast forward to June 4th, 1978. Um, can you describe a little bit about what happened that day? The motorcyclists up in the Plumas and what they found. Yeah, there were three uh, guys on a motorcycle trip up in the Plumas area. Uh, it was a father, his son, and a family friend. They had been riding around all day. And for whatever reason, they thought they could get around some of the roads. But the weather had been really bad in California, much like how it is now. A lot of snow, rain, mudslides. And some of the roads they were trying to travel were, you know, there were trees down. And it was not quite the, the fun trip they had planned. But they knew... At some point, they had passed a place called the Daniels Inc. Campground. And that site had a map of the area. And they thought if they looked at the map of the area, they can figure out a good way to get back home. But when they went back to look at the map, they noticed that there was a strange smell in the area. And they kind of knew what it was, but didn't want to say what it was. They kind of rode around a little bit and come up, they came across up, or they came upon some fire trailers that were used by the forestry service for workers to use if they're stationed up there and they had like beds and food in them. And the son of one of the riders noticed that the smell was coming from one of the trailers. They looked and saw that a window had been opened in the trailer and they looked in, saw someone was in the bed and kind of knew something was wrong. They called the sheriff's department after like riding down to a Denny's or somewhere. And when law enforcement finally showed up, <clears throat> excuse me, they um, went up to the trailer and that's where they found Ted Weir. Weir was on one of the beds. He had blankets over him. He had lost 80 to 100 pounds. He was 200 pounds at the time of his disappearance. He was wearing the same clothes. They found like his ring next to the bed and like i said the clothes were just a match to the day he went missing and there were cans of food open in the trailer uh, which were sea ration cans uh, military meals and things like that so someone had been in the trailer they had also found gary matthias's tennis shoes in the trailer and so that was the beginning of the discoveries of the men and then Days after Ted's found, the remains of Jack Madruga and Bill Sterling are found south of the trailer, about a mile or two. And then after they're found, about a day or so, the remains of Jackie Hewitt are found. After that, they have four of the men's missing, you know, the four of the men's remains have been found. 
And that is early June, 1978. And they kind of spend part of the rest of the month trying to find Gary. But before the month ends, they put an end to the search for Gary Mathias and he's never been found since. Right. And so one of the things we know is that Gary Mathias's shoes were found in the trailer. So right. we can make a, we can make a good assumption that he was there with Weir. Yes. Um, one of the things that was frustrating to me when I covered this case was this idea that a snow cat had gone up to the trailer to knock off snow from the roofs. We knew it happened, but I could never really find what route they took. Because if you look at the spread of the bodies of Madruga, Sterling, and Hewitt, it looks like they took the longest route possible to get to the trailers. Right. And I always wondered, did the snowcat really do that same route, that long route? Do you know anything about whether or not that was the route it took, this long kind of looping route to get to the trailers? I'm not 100% sure about what the route would have looked like, but to get from the car that to get from the abandoned car to the trailers, you're going to go like Northwest along these yeah. roads that sort of wind through the Sierra Nevada yeah. in the Plumas. And it ends up being like 12 miles, even though it's five miles across the land. It's just the way that right. the roads very, are done. Very windy. Yeah. Yeah. And we thought it was, and talking with some other Yuba County five researchers, we think they did that path, the path that they followed to the trailers, just because the trailers, from what I was told, were, are, were relatively new. They wanted the snow off the roof to avoid any kind of damage or leaking of snow into the trailer. And if they saw that path, they probably decided to follow that. Right. Path, but, of, path it, of least resistance almost. But even though going upward kind of uh, goes yeah. against that idea, but still it would be the obvious path to follow. Uh, yeah, and even uh, uh, one of the investigators from the Yuba County Sheriff's Department who was up there said for, the, for them to get to the car, to those trailers, to make that journey along the road is just unbelievable. It really is, yeah. Like <laughs> how, how did they, he, he was even baffled how they did that walk in those conditions. Yeah, because um, people have to remember they were basically in their, you know, the lower part of California clothes, you know, they, you know, lightweight clothing. It's yeah. freezing out. They don't have the right even shoes for it. Those shoes will get wet and cold real quick that they were, you know, and, uh, and when you're in a, I find if you're in a group of people, things take a lot longer than if you're just one person walking. Cause if you're one exactly. person walking, you, you know what you need to do and you have to motivate yourself and that's it. If you're in a group and somebody starts lagging behind a little bit, you're going to be trying to stop. We got to get this person up and moving again, you know, and, and it takes longer. So this was right. probably a very long and arduous trek that they took. Yeah. And I, I find it hard that they would have left anyone behind knowing how the five were as friends and the kind of people that they were in general. I, I, I find it hard to believe they would leave someone behind out of the group if, you know, Sterling, people feel like Sterling Madruga could have been the first two to fall behind. And then Gary, Ted, and Jackie made it to the trailer. One theory I've had is that they all made it to the trailer and maybe Gary was the first to leave because he didn't have his medication. And maybe he decided to take someone else's shoes. Um, that That's definitely a possibility. And when Gary left, whatever way Gary took, he never was found again. Hmm. And then the next person or persons that would have left could have been Jack Madruga and Bill Sterling. They could have said, Hey, Gary hasn't come back. Let's go look. Um, and then it's believed Jackie Hewitt left after Ted Weir passed away. It could have been too much for him. And, you know, that's why they were found where they were found. Interesting. But, Again, these are only theories, and right. it would just it, it, it's hard to imagine them leaving someone behind. I got but it. again, yeah. if they're experiencing hypothermia, um, lack of food, lack of water, uh, all this sort of creates this perfect storm where you almost have you're, you're delirious, you're 
there's really no common sense because of, you know, when hypothermia hits you, it's, it's, it's absolutely horrible. And if you're not going to warm yourself up, you're, you're doomed. So, Um, and and that's an, and that's another thing too. I mean, they got to the trailer where they found Ted Weir. I mean, there was a, something they could have just turned, you know, the, yeah, like the, the nozzle gas to, yeah, and it, they couldn't, they didn't do that, but they said the snow could have covered the gas, or the propane canister, whatever, whatever canister it was outside the trailer, and they probably wouldn't have seen it at the time. This reminds uh, me actually of something that I wanted to ask you because it was something I couldn't find an answer to. Um, it and that is people often talk about why didn't they make a fire in there. And I always said, I've never seen any evidence that there was like some place to make a fire in there, like some, some, you know, any wood stove or anything. I've never heard any reference to that. All my understanding was that the heating was based off of uh, gas. And to me, the idea of them just like starting a fire someplace in the trailer might have been frightening to we or, or maybe both the guys that were in there. But what what is your take on this fire, starting a fire thing? You know, I talked to some of the family members and they, there was even some quote at the time, they didn't start a fire, which surprised them. Um, they thought, because if you look at, there is film uh, of the trailer and the trailer where Ted's found here and there's another one like right across the way. And there could have been some space where they could have tried to set something on fire, maybe burn some stuff in the like, barrel. Like outside? Yes. I mean, okay. It, it, so is that what they're talking about? I always thought they were talking about like inside to heat because, you know, Weir's in there. He's probably immobile and probably freezing. And so I always assumed they were talking about heating the trailer somehow. And that's what always they, confused me, I guess. They, I think they might have tried heating the trailer itself. They probably didn't have anything in there other than a candle, which yeah. is not going to generate enough right. heat to, to save anybody. I don't care who you are. Um, but what's also um frustrating is there could have been a way outside they could have started a fire to create smoke and if they would have created the smoke someone could have been alerted to that and saying something's on fire something's burning um it it, and they even used a helicopter to look for the guys and it seemed to have been used more than once and they claimed to have covered pretty good territory with the helicopter Right. And it's all part of the mystery. Like, did you see the trailers? Did you, which way did you, cause that's another thing we're missing. We do not have a map showing like, yeah, this is the area we searched. Right. This is where we went and this is what we covered. Um, none, none of that's available. So at, in the end with the trailer being to the Northwest of them, or I'm sorry, to the Northeast of the car, not to Northwest. It, it's still like, okay, how far did you go to look with the helicopter, with your search and rescue teams, because they were up there March and probably part of April. Um, I know they really weren't up there much in May, but like when you were doing all this work, when you had people up there, what were you doing? Where did you go? And in the end, the U.S. Forest Service said, we told you about those trailers. And everyone just started saying, oh, no, you didn't. You didn't tell us anything about those trailers. Uh, We didn't know about them. And another problem was you had Yuba County Sheriff's Office, Butte County Sheriff's Office, uh, the trailer where where Ted Weir and some of the bodies were found uh, was in Plumas County. And then there's Sutter County because Bill Sterling was from Yuba City. So and then you had California sort of their Department of Justice involved, too. So you have a lot of jurisdictions coming in, uh, search and rescue teams from other areas, the helicopters from the California Highway Patrol, how much information is being shared, how well are people effectively communicating, you know, right. the search and rescue efforts to each other. It, it's just, it, it's sad and it's frustrating because I, I do believe the forestry service, when they said like, hey, we told you about these trailers, you should go check them. And one of the family members was told that uh, they wouldn't have made it, they, you know, because of their disabilities. They they would have never found their way to those trailers. It's, they couldn't have done that. Yeah. But they did. So if they made it there, 
it's it's like they're they're being underestimated for their you know for their developmental disabilities or, or mental illness and i think that still uh makes the families mad to this very day and it's part of the reason like they, they keep track of a lot of these videos that come out on youtube or the podcasts that come out oh, yeah and they always they immediately go to the comment section because they want to know what people think and you know it's it's either the same thing well gary's crazy because he has schizophrenia and the guys yeah, yeah. all had disabilities and they weren't smart so this you know, always a cop out i think to try and find an easy answer that they didn't really have to look into um yeah I, and they say well they got lost but at the same time you know drew beeson brought this up to me when when i first started talking to drew he said hey these guys don't have a record of getting lost because they would take out of town trips but there's never a story someone had like oh well you know that one time they went out of town they got lost none of the family members mentioned anything about these guys getting lost before they said they had been to chico before so if they've gone to chico they know how to get back and another thing is um which is really strange the day before they went missing they decided to have basketball practice and they would typically practice in the city but the school where they would practice said hey we got a thing going on tonight so i just can't use the gym but bill sterling wanted to practice and his mom's like call around the places see what's open and he said oh, i found a gymnasium she's like great where is it he said uh it's down a drive to a school that they may have never visited um they're back you know what i mean so um hmm. it, it what what bugs me is like they, they keep saying they get lost and i'm like jack madruga is from loma rica california he's you know his family says he's driven to chico he's been to sacramento he's driven to other communities he's never had an incident um he was a reliable driver he just doesn't disappear. Sorry. And them getting lost. I, I know in Jack Madruga's family, who I interviewed, said he would have known well enough to turn around and go home. And something happened that night where it something led them to that road. Either something, some perceived danger that they knew was coming. Or they were trying to get away from someone or a group of people for whatever reason. And, and that's yeah. what I believe, like something went down that night and they were trying to get away and things just progressively just got worse and worse and worse. And it just because there was no reason for them to leave the car. They could have stayed in Jack Madruga's car and stayed warm. You just yeah. don't all get out of a car and leave. Um, um, I want to I want to backtrack for one second because there's a, sure there's this question that it's kind of a debate a little bit that I've seen happening between people. And it's a comment. I get a lot about um, this case, especially in my presentation of it too. Uh, Cause sure. I guess, I guess what I said about it's different from what other people have thought in terms of, uh, and in your book, I saw it brought up a lot, uh, not by you, but by people, you know, you interviewed and that's in, in any theory involving the, that Jack Madruga and Bill Sterling died on the way to the trailer those theories, especially in your book, often have Jackie Hewitt making that it him making it there too, alive. Yes. I, it's my it's my position that if if Sterling and Madruga died on the way there, Hewitt likely did too. Do you know why people think Hewitt made it to the trailer when as far as I can tell, there's no evidence he ever was in there? As far from what I remember, um Jack, so okay, so as as far as the parents go, the last of the parents to die was Jackie Hewitt's dad, and that was around 2018. He was the last surviving family member to be interviewed. He was interviewed by a company called Mopac Audio, who did a Yuba podcast. And in his interview, he claimed that when he went into the trailer, he saw something written down in Jackie's handwriting. Hmm. Um and people who i've talked to who knew ted and jackie would say there's no way though ted would have left jackie behind or vice versa the bond that they had the friendship they had like leaving a friend behind to die um and, and thinking about that myself i, I 
just can't bring myself to believe that Ted would let Jackie just go off like that and perish. I mean, it's interesting. There's, there's, and I, I've had discussions with, you know, four of the five families, uh, Sterling's family was the only one that didn't want to be interviewed, but that's been consistent with them over the years. But the other families I've talked to said, you know, it's either Doc stayed back with Bill Sterling or Bill Sterling stayed back with Jack Madruga when Doc was Jack Madruga's nickname uh, when when they were walking to the trailer. That's a possibility. Or they could have left together to go find help. Um, but they said to see those two close to where they were, they felt that for whatever reason, those two were together. But other people that I've talked to family wise if they were going to put money on people getting into the trailer, it would have been Gary, Ted and Jackie all getting into the trailer together. Um, hmm. See, yeah, someone emailed me and they did say that thing about Jackie Hewitt's father saying that I was, I didn't know where they got that information. So they got it from a pod. But I, when they told me that my immediate thought was, if you're going to say that there was evidence that Jackie Hewitt was in the trailer, then you're, almost saying that Lance Ayers wasn't really invested, the lead investigator, who wasn't really invested in in solving this thing because there was never anything in the case file about evidence Jackie was in the trailer. And, and I feel like they wouldn't have ignored that. And in addition to that, when you look at the state of decomposition on all three of the bodies, Jackie Hewitt was maybe more, if not equally decomposed as all of the other two men. I mean, they found his bones, you right? Know? And and it's, he was must have been out there at least as long as Madruga and Sterling, in my opinion, because he was there. There wasn't much meat left on the bones, so to say. I mean, he was quite skeletonized, and yeah, that it, to it, me says he must have been there for a while. And 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 I got to think, you know, Ted Weir, his his feet were so frostbitten, uh, and he was immobile for that, and. I mean, I, I don't know these guys personally, but, you know, I mean, if, if their feet were all starting to get like that, you have to, to wonder, you know, the only guy that really has shown that he could really endure that kind of pain maybe was Matthias because he, he did some long treks on, on foot uh, across the country and, and, and endured that kind of thing. I don't know. What do you think about that? And, I mean, all valid points. And I, I had the same feelings about, you know, learning about decomposition and the people that put together the Mopac audio. Uh, I think they talked to an anthropologist and the doctor about how long does it take to get uh, for, I mean, it's very morbid, but for bodies to decay like that. Um, and, and they talked about how surprising it is that you could go from point A to point B. Um, now, yeah, with the temperature and with the thaw up there, um, animals, unfortunately, uh, getting involved in this, um, it, it, the way that these bodies did decompose, um, they did say from their experience, the way bodies do decompose, I don't want to get too graphic, but, uh, they said at times you are surprised to see how it gets from one point to another. Um, I'm not an expert in the field, so I don't want to be quoted on that directly. <laughs> gotcha. I, 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 I do completely understand your point of view, especially like what jack madruga bill sterling and jackie hewitt and yeah with ted having frostbite we did uh, mopac audio did talk to someone i heard that interview that had experience with frostbite and they say when that kicks in especially if it's in your feet walking becomes unbearable so how you can do a tw they they were shocked that if they could do this 12 mile walk with frostbite Right. Um, because well, and I guess, the, you know, it wasn't Jackie, you. wasn't Jackie Hewitt's body found like a mile, maybe a little bit more from the trailer itself yes. on the. And so to me, you know, if he was at the trailer and then he left and we're saying he only could make it a mile. I mean, either he was in horrible condition and he just decided to go out in horrible condition and died after a mile. But to me, that just sounds kind of weird. Why would he leave in the first place if he was in such bad condition? Why? It seems like, you know, if, you know, going the other direction, we're saying he was walked almost 11 miles and would have collapsed, which feels a lot, you know, I don't know. It's one of those small points I get a lot of comments about. And 
and a lot of questions about you know who made it to what at what time you know but we really we we don't know i i fully could believe in your theory that they all made it there in, in some sense you know um and that maybe they you know but then again we you know we're dealing with the situation where well we're saying jackie only made it a mile out from the trailer he must have been in horrible you know i don't know it's uh it's hard to tell because, but even inside the trailer, 30 of this uh, roughly 30 C ration cans were opened. Right. So, which is if, not a lot for four people across or five people across how many months were they? Exactly. You know, they think Ted Weir was alive for eight to 12 weeks, something like that. Yeah. And I mean, his cause of death was pulmonary edema, which I believe that's the pronunciation of the term. But yeah, I mean, if, you, if you're resting on your back, uh, and you have all that pressure on your chest that's incredibly painful, along with the frostbite. And he was experiencing, I think, gangrene from an infection, uh, or like a sort of like a blood infection as well. So, yeah, uh, it, it wasn't, it, I mean, it was the clock was definitely ticking for all of them. But, you know, knowing Ted, how he was able to manage for so long, it's such, horrifying. It, it's very rough conditions. And, and like we said, like, you know, people get to the trailer and then they leave. How long were they at the trailers? What we don't know. Could they have been in there a day or two? Could they have just gotten there and said, okay, Ted has a place to rest. Maybe we can, I don't know what kind of second when you can get. Um, what happened? And it, it's, it's all of these unknowns within the Yuba County 5 case that we've been trying to put together since... 1978 because the big reason is why they exit to go into Oroville because the only way they could have ended up on that road is if they went into the town of Oroville, which we've theorized that they could have had to stop and use a restroom or something happened where they had to pull off, you know, the highway and maybe somebody wanted to get something uh, that they didn't have a bear's market or whatever. And something happens in Oroville once they park the car somewhere, they meet up with some people they know who have unfinished business with someone or some of them in the group, or they run into some drunk people in the community who might have, you know, seen that the guys were, you know, develop me, or developmentally disabled and uh, may have wanted to start a fight or something. And there's all these questions because you got to get on that Oroville Quincy Highway to get into the Plumas. And once you're in the Plumas, you of all the roads that they pick, they pick the one that's like middle nowhere, um, like towards a point that I talked to someone who worked in the Plumas at the time. They said there's a point where they would have driven and the road would have been like there would have been a chain across the road uh, blocking it, saying you can't, you can't keep going. So it, let's see, they see that sign or those chains. They could have just turned around on the road, pulled back, gone that way, down the hill. Okay, but why'd they go up a side road that went nowhere? And there's nothing as far as signage that would have said, oh, yeah, this connects to highway, whatever. It didn't. And you yeah, there was a... Oh, go ahead. I was, you certainly get the feeling that whatever drove them up there, there was some unknown force behind mm -hmm. it. And But what what... Kind of confounds that statement in a way is that madruga had his keys on him they were found yes. with the body so the idea that someone else drove the car seems odd at that point that madruga right. would have the keys back at, at somehow and, and so he's it, the it, one driving right and so if he's the one driving how do you get them up there you know are you dri is someone driving behind them which you know it, there is some some evidence to support that with one of Shones' own stories. Well, no. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You know, he talks about, I don't know, he talks about so many things, but, you know, one of his one of his stories was that a car followed him so closely that it made him so angry and, and then yeah. he got stuck. And then another one, he's saying somebody was following the boys, essentially. And, you know, and so it's yeah. who is following who and what's, you know, they're completely different stories. And it makes me angry just thinking about it sometimes because it, it's like it sends you in completely different directions each time, you know? Yeah. I was talking to a few people who had experiences in the Plumas where they were just riding around up there and 
they just come across people and they were not very friendly and asking them like, what are you doing up here? Why are you up here? What's going on? And one person uh, I was talking to said they were just taking like their motorcycle out. They were riding around and they came on a road and the car was sort of at an angle. And there was a guy with a gun, almost like some sort of like walking dead, in, you know, kind of scenario um, where you're running into some of these people. And the guy's like, what are you doing up here? He's like, I'm just riding my bike. And he's like, go home. And the guy's like, fine. And I, I've, I've heard that from people like man, there's a different group of people up there in the Plumas. I mean, it's, you run across the wrong person. It's going to be, you know, it's, it's, it's going to be rough. Yeah. <clears throat> and is that something that could have happened? Possibly. I don't know, but. I've always had the cool. feeling that a gun was involved. When I picture it in my head, five guys, it has to be. five guys running upwards, you know, like yeah. you don't you don't just go up you know they knew where they came from and they knew where they could get to maybe the mountain house or whatever running down is the obvious choice if you are free and stuck in that area but they went up and that really sounds like someone forced them up said go run up this way you know almost and the only yeah. way to do that with five guys like that would you know someone would need to have like a gun or you outnumber them by a great deal you know and uh and and you know in my in my video I made on it, I kind of proposed that maybe this was Shones who, I don't think I outright said he would have a gun, but that was always my thought. Maybe he had a gun and, and did it. You know, I, I didn't want to say it at the time, but, but not, uh, now, you know, but that doesn't solve the problem of how did they get there? You right. Know? And it's, and it's if half someone, a theory. And that's what the parents were asked when, you know, they were looking for the guys and they didn't have much of clues. They said, Hey, if someone comes up to a gun to your son, how do you think they'd react? And everyone's like, well, they'd be complicit. They'd comply. Uh, with a person with a gun and follow orders. Um, and and that's been mentioned quite a bit with this case is that someone probably had a gun. And it's the reason why the window was rolled down partially on the Montego is that Madruga or someone in the car could have been talking to someone and they could have just pulled a gun on them and like get out because it also explains why five people would exit a car. Um, well, someone and I know people have said, well, they were stuck and they freaked out. Well, you know, you could get out of the car and and try walking down the road uh, towards um, a place like Mountain House. And the person I talked to that did work for the Forestry Service said, when you get up into the Plumas in certain areas during the winter time, it's beyond. I mean, he said it was super easy to get lost up there and to get disoriented because there was just something about the place where you start walking you want to make sure that you're like marking your path or you've got a good sense of direction or you got a compass or something because it's he, he's, he says it's just kind of scary it could be scary up there and downright overwhelming being up in the plumas that time of year especially when you got snow everywhere and it's just like an unforgiving landscape yeah. so well, um, I know you got to go real soon, um, but I just want to ask, you know, I'm sure people are going to wonder. You've done a tremendous amount of research on this case. Your book, again, called Things Aren't Right. It's a great. I'll link it in the description so people can go and buy it if they want. It's got Thank as, you. It has all the information you could ever want on the case. But you've looked into this so much. Is there do you have a certain theory you lean towards? I'm not necessarily concrete or anything or do you have a certain someone you think may have been holding that gun you think may have been used? Where do you kind of go on this? Do you, do you lean any direction? Not towards one person in particular. I know that there is a possible, there's a lot of names that have come up over the years where people say, you know, you got to look at this person, you got to look at this person. And sometimes you find names of people by talking to certain people like, well, there was this person and then there was this person. What I, what I believe is they exited the highway at Oroville for a reason. And I think it was either use the restroom or to do something. And when they exited and wherever they stopped, something happened at the place where they stopped and everything just began to unravel. And I think they knew something was about to go down. And it was serious and they decided to 
make a run for it and get away from the problem. And that was unsuccessful. And either they're forced up the road by someone or they get chased by someone. And it's the reason why the car is abandoned in the middle of nowhere. It's why they never stayed in the car. Um, I mean, they could have waited till morning to, to get out of the car or find help. And it, it just didn't happen. And, and that's been my theory for a long time, because when you get when you see, oh, they got lost. You know, I, I've driven that way up into the Plumas twice during the day and during the night. You got plenty of places to turn around. And you, there's no way you make this drive by accident. I mean, it's because if you drive around Marysville, if you drive around Yuba City, you drive up towards Chico, it's flat. There's you're going to see trees, especially because the, it's the area is tied to agriculture. So you know what the lay of the land is and you can see the, the foothills of the Sierra in the distance. And once you're up there, you know, you're not heading home. You're going way far away from home. And so something really went wrong and things weren't right at the time. And it's driven a lot of people crazy. I mean, this uh, February 24th is coming up. So this will be yeah. the 46th anniversary of the case because uh, last year was the 45th. Yeah. And we're still no closer to having any answers than we were back then. And I'm hoping the book kind of jumpstarts someone's memory or allows someone to come forward and say, hey, this is what I know. This is what someone told me. Because I've heard that myself from people in the area. They're like, well, this is what we heard happen. And I'm like, well, that's pretty serious. Um, and it's yeah. something I don't say publicly because it's like, it's just a rumor. Yeah, there's a lot and of rumors. Yeah. And if there's truth to the rumor, then please help. You know what I mean? It, it, Cause what's interesting is like, you have all these people who aren't close, who don't know each other, who are just random people in the area. And they're all kind of telling similar stories. How does that happen? I mean, that's, that's quite a, I mean, it's quite a, I don't know, urban legend on one hand, it could be, but at the same time, if there's fact to this, you're going to have to start connecting the dots and figure out like what happened to these guys. But I, I truly think whatever happened, I've, I've often felt like the person that it's, it was connected to was probably Gary Mathias. I, I think for whatever reason, oh, I someone, see what saw, yeah. someone that night may have, you know, they saw he might Gary have had a lot of enemies, right? Yeah, yeah, I mean, Gary, you know, a month or two before the guys went missing, had a couple fights at two parties, and it could have been some unfinished business between this yeah. person and Gary. And I think things could have gotten, I, it, it's easy for things to get out of hand, and I think that's what could have happened that night. Again, no solid evidence, no concrete proof. It's just a theory, and um, I, I'm glad that so many people are, interested in the case and i'm glad that you had a chance to work on the video as well and i like the fact that you were able to look through the yuba county sheriff's department files as well and look through you know all the you know research information that we have and to continue to bring the story out there because if you look at like all the youtube channels and podcasts i mean this story is popular not only in the united states but around the world and it's a mystery that people have been talking about since 2018 when this story came back and I don't know the person that brought the story back into the spotlight, but I'm glad they did because um, this story could have been buried in time and nobody really caring. And um, I'm discovering there's a lot of people who care and people are doing research in other countries on the case and really want this mystery solved. So it's great to see people like yourself out there doing the right thing and doing great work and trying to bring this story back into the spotlight and just giving people you know, something to think about with this case and help out with theories and anything. I mean, it's greatly appreciated. Yeah, no, thank you. I, and I appreciate your work as well. Uh, it was uh, really cool to see someone who had uh, interviewed all the family members. Um, you know, I remember when I tried to get in touch with some of the family, I remember I contacted one of them and they said they were, they couldn't talk to me because they had signed a contract with someone who was making a documentary about the thing. And so I was like, whoa. <laughs> There's some somebody's making a documentary in the background somewhere about this. I don't know what it is, but 
Um, so it was great to actually hear from the families th through your book. And um, I, anyone who is interested in this um, on any level should check out, check out Tony's book. It's called things aren't right. Um, it's, it's got all the information you'd ever want. I mean, it's very thorough. Uh, like Thank you. you said, there's nothing I would, I could have thought to add to it. And, um, and you don't put a lot of, you know, I, I like to also comment, you don't put a lot of your own stuff in there until the end, you know, at the end, you kind of go, this is kind of what I think after, but mostly you let the people do the talking who were involved in the case. And That's important. I appreciated that. Good. Uh, uh, you know, there wasn't a lot of your own narrative in there, which is great. Um, yeah. So. A lot of these people never had a chance to talk to the press and it was their time to get what they wanted off their chest. And I'm like, let it, you know, just share what you want to share. And I'm glad that they did. And I'm glad that they're, um, you know, they're in the book and you can hear what they have to say. And it, it, it's uh, great knowing that um, I'm still in contact with the families and we formed a great friendship and bond and you can't beat that. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Um, so again, People check out the book. Things aren't right. Link in the description. Um, anything else you want to add, Tony, or are we good? We are good. Thank you for having me on the show. Um, like I said, the two-part video series you did was great. I really appreciate it. Um, thank you all. Please check out the book, and uh, we'll talk again sooner than later. Absolutely. Thanks, Tony.